TSN's Motoring 96 is brought to you by Quaker State. Exceeds the highest standards for engine protection. And Midas, the way it should be. It was never the prettiest car on the block, but for Volvo owners, that didn't matter. Volvo stood for safety, and that's exactly what sold these cars. But let's face it, all manufacturers today are selling safety. So the question is, how has this new trend affected Volvo's ability to sell cars, and is the company concerned about its image? Well, we hope to find some answers here in Gothenburg, Sweden, where Volvo is announcing some new products, including a brand new all-wheel drive. Life has been anything but dull for Volvo over the last couple of years. After rejecting a merger with Renault in 1993, Volvo's popular chairman resigned. Then sales in Western Europe took a nosedive. In fact, car and truck sales in Sweden dropped 50%. On the bright side, sales in Canada have been impressive. It has gone very well for us. I mean, our sales in 1992 was 3,450 units. And then we have the introduction of the 850 in 1993. And we were up to 5,100. And then it was up in 94 to 7,100. And last year we were at 7,800. And this year we go for 8,000. Volvo's biggest market is North America, where it sold close to 100,000 cars last year. 80% of those sales were 850s, first introduced in 1993. A lot of our future products is based on the 850s platform. And uh, uh, you can also say that without the 850 today, uh, Volvo Car Corporation wouldn't exist. The 850 is also the car that Volvo hopes will change its image. ABN. I think that our image has been a little bit can I say bulky before, mm -hmm. and I think that is very much because of, of uh, performance. Today we have cars with very high performance like T5R and the 850R2. Now we present an important addition, the energy absorbing Volvo SIPS bag. A laboratory test at Volvo's Safety Research Center will show you how it works. In only 12 milliseconds, the SIPS bag inflates from its position in the backrest and is ready to protect you. The Volvo SIPS bag is now available in the 850 series. Safety is still the main issue when you look at the car with the side impact airbags as one leading uh, safety feature. When you talk about what it's done, I think it's brought a different uh, customer, perhaps a little bit younger. Somebody interested in maybe a few other aspects of car ownership, performance would be one, certainly with the turbo model being very, very strong. So it, it has broadened our appeal immensely, I think. The 850 is being dubbed the car for all seasons. With a coupe and convertible on the horizon, the current 850 is available with a high pressure and light pressure turbo, a diesel in Europe, and now, for North America, an all-wheel version. We thought we absolutely needed this car. Um, Volvo is going for a more lifestyle-oriented image. And we think we need the four-wheel drive for that. The success in Canada, sports utilities, Ford Explorers, the Jeep Cherokees, I think what we like to do is bring a, a bit of an alternative, more car-like, but still offering all the features of an all-wheel drive vehicle. Volvo is not only changing the image of its cars, but also the way it sells them. We have already in Europe uh, introduced something which we call customer order production. That means that today not one car on the line is being built without having a customer or a dealer behind it. So no cars at all are being built on speculation. And uh, in Halifax, in Nova Scotia, in our uh, plant there, we will now start to experiment and try uh, for the first time in the North American market customer order production. It means that uh, instead of going to the dealership uh, looking at uh, a month, two months, three months old car, maybe with the wrong color and uh, square tires, you would uh, order your car and it would be tailor-made for you. 
you will have to wait uh, maybe six, seven, uh, eight weeks, but when the car arrives, it's exactly what you wanted. Final question. You like the new image of this company? Yeah, I love it. I love it. I, I don't know whether you think one can talk about an image lag, and I think that is what exists for us in the United States, for instance. Uh, a market where, where our image is based upon hundreds of thousands of 245s and 745s with maybe a woman behind the wheel and two kids and maybe a dog at the rear. Now we, we are delivering new products, more exciting products, and I think that will make great things for us in, in North America. The dog's still welcome. Absolutely. <laughs>
The pistons have a molybdenum coating and feature smaller skirts, and the rings have been thinned down, all of which reduced power sapping friction. Stopping power is supplied by a four-wheel disc brake system that offers standard anti-lock. In the race to rest, the i30 required 114 feet to stop from 80k. I've already mentioned the positives about the rear suspension design when it comes to handling. Well, it has one other distinct advantage. Its compact design allows for a lot more space in the back seat. Now your rear passengers can travel in complete comfort. The downside to this Infiniti is the fact that the interior design is boring, boring, boring. Maybe somebody from Mercedes-Benz or BMW should take the interior designer from Nissan out for a beer. You know, I've been with this car for a week, and there's an old saying, boring wears thin very quickly, or well, quite frankly, I'm worn through. Extended pelvic lumbar support. That's part of the secret to the comfort of these front seats. You know what? Even Elvis and his twiggly little pelvis would find it comfy up front. <laughs> On the safety front, the i30 has the lot in place right down to the integrated Homelink transmitter. This nifty device allows you to program up to three different devices, a garage door opener for instance. As one might expect, the i30 comes loaded with everything one could possibly want, from the power door locks and windows to a glorious sounding 200 watt AM FM stereo that gets both a cassette and a CD player. The i30 is quite a piece of machinery, especially when you add the T. It offers power, handling and sophistication in a very practical package. Is it worth the extra dosh when compared to the Maxima? For me, I'm afraid not. However, sales of the i30 would seem to contradict my stance. It's time to update our long-term caravan. Yes, I know, I'm beginning to sound like Kenzie Harp and on about photo radar, but I'm talking about the left side door again for two reasons. First of all, for us at Motoring, it adds practicality and versatility that is paramount in any minivan design. The other thing it's done, it's forced Ford's hand. They're now going to bring forward by a full year their planned introduction of the fourth door on the Windstar. Now, any time a company like Chrysler forces a company like Ford to change its mind, you know they're onto a hot item, and this door is that very item. If you own or operate a Ford fuel-injected vehicle, which is just about anything since about 1986, there's something that you should be aware of. Those Fords with fuel injection, be they cars or light trucks, uh, use a fuel pump shutoff switch, sometimes referred to as an inertia switch. It's located somewhere on the vehicle's body. In the case of a passenger car, it's usually in the trunk area, either back here on the side or up at the front of the trunk. If it's a light truck, uh, it's located in the cab. Now what you should do is refer to your owner's manual to find the location of that device because there may be instances where you're going to have to reset that. Now the intention of this device is to shut off the fuel pressure, which is quite high in these vehicles, 36 to 42 PSI isn't uncommon on some of them. It, it shuts off that fuel pressure in the event of a collision so that if the fuel lines on the car should become severed in that collision you won't have fuel spraying under high pressure that could create a fire but if somebody smacks your car even slightly in a parking lot you may never have been aware that they've even done it there could be no damage to your vehicle but that shutoff switch could have tripped and your engine won't start we get service calls all the time where we're called out to restart these vehicles and it's as simple as pressing the button I'm going to smack this one with my bare hand and the car's going to shut off a few seconds later when the fuel pressure dies. Now on this topaz, it's just up in the corner of the truck, you can see that yellow label that flags its location. And there it goes. One smack and it's dead. Now remember that this is a safety feature for it is engineered into their cars and light trucks. But as you've seen today, it doesn't take a heck of a lot to trip that fuel pump shutoff switch. So what I'm advising you to do is first of all familiarize yourself with the location of that switch on the passenger cars that's in the trunk, on the light trucks that's in the cab. And also familiarize yourself on how to reset it. It's all in your owner's manual. If you consult it, it will tell you the exact procedure and location. 
Till next week, I'm Bill Gardner for Motoring 96. Subaru chose the New York Auto Show to unveil three new vehicles for 1997. The Legacy GT, the Impreza Outback Sport, and the Outback Limited, all based on the popular Legacy Outback. 1997 Subaru Outback Legacy Limited Edition. When we developed the Outback, we've been selling, um, actually in the United States, all-wheel or four-wheel drive products for 22 years. But when we, when we packaged the Outback, and we wanted to play and participate in the utility vehicle market, so what we did is we made a derivative Subaru product off of a passenger car platform, but we added the utility vehicle styling cues, we raised the suspension, we, had, we changed the interior, but we took a product that we were really good at and made a hybrid vehicle. We, we, in some ways, we created a new niche or we created a new market, but it was a, a good one for us because it's what we specialize in. Get ready for the ride of your life. Just another day in the Outback. Hogan Outback, coming to Subaru dealers everywhere. Well, it's supposed to be the Australian Outback, but it's in Bakersfield, California. So I, when we shot the commercial, I was in the, the Bahamas doing the Flipper, the movie. So I couldn't fly back to Australia, so we come up and shot it in... Uh, Bakersfield in California pretended it was the Australian Outback. But it's the same sort of country. You know, I think it's the best kept secret in America. It's, it's an excellent car. Oh, it's, it's cool. I mean, I've got a couple of free cars as well. <laughs> the Audi TT Roadster, a product of Audi's young avant garde team of designers and engineers. In just one year, the Audi TT has gone from concept to reality. The Audi TT Spider Roadster and the Coupe have been a big hit on this year's auto show circuit. The TT is based on the platform of a forthcoming new small car from Audi, a golf-sized A3. To save labor costs, Audi will build the new car in Hungary. It will be Audi's first production site outside Germany. The initials TT refer to the Tourist Trophy, the oldest British motorsports event held on public roads. Well, you'll see the car uh, being built in 1998. Uh, no final decision yet of coming to North America, but I'm pretty sure that it will come to this market. It was designed here and is uh, well suited to, uh, to this uh, market. It really is all about uh, creating a uh, small roadster and coupe. Um, around $35,000, $45,000, no final pricing fixed on it yet. So a real entry-level car for the Audi mark, for younger people to bring them into the, uh, the Audi family, and then obviously later to come through the A4, A6, A8 route. A little bit about the color here. Well, it, we chose it uh, to be completely different. Most uh, cars, when you reveal them, these shows are all glossy, etc. This car's all about simplicity and understatement and that the car basically speaks for itself. It's got a passion and, a des and desire, and we, it didn't need sparkly colors, and, and it's different. Is there a market waiting right now for this vehicle in Europe? Oh, we believe so, definitely. All the reactions around the world have shown the car have been extremely positive, so we just got to get on and make it and get it out there now. Our Midas tip of the week concerns starting procedure. I'm sure that most of you grew up with vehicles with carburetors on where it was absolutely mandatory to hit that throttle once or twice in order to set the choke and get that car started in cold weather. Now with today's fuel injected vehicles, it isn't necessary to touch the throttle when you're starting. You just turn the key, the computer does everything else, and that engine should fire up and run reliably. However, there may be circumstances where the vehicle needs an assist to start. If you have difficulty starting, for example, a car or truck with single point or throttle body type fuel injection, when they get high mileage, you may find that in cold weather it's necessary to give them quarter throttle while you're cranking. As soon as the engine fires up, come back out of the throttle slowly to control the engine speed. Uh, you may also find that a vehicle with fuel injection, under certain circumstances, it may flood itself with fuel a lot easier than you'd expect. In that case, bury your foot right to the floor in the throttle and crank the engine. When the uh, computer recognizes 
thr uh, wide open throttle and cranking together, it assumes that you're trying to clear flood the engine and it electronically cuts back the amount of fuel that's injected into the engine. It will assist you in starting. Just keep in mind again that as soon as the engine does fire, you've got to listen closely and come out of that throttle slowly so you don't overspeed the engine. That's your Midas tip of the week. Is the price of gasoline getting you down? Well, stop buying gasoline. Coming up next on Kenzie's Corner. Kenzie's Corner with Jim Kenzie. Yes, indeed, folks, the sound of fuel economy, the unmistakable rattle of a diesel engine. Now, diesels are very popular here in Europe because, frankly, gasoline costs a whole heck of a lot more here than it does back in Canada. But is there a diesel market in Canada? Well, most people would say, no, there's not. Now, Volkswagen sells almost half of their Golfs as diesels, even in Canada, mostly in Quebec, because it's quite popular there. There's a handful of Mercedes-Benz diesels, but for the most part, most Canadians think diesels are smelly and they're slow and make a lot of noise and frankly there's not a lot of places to buy the fuel. Now I happen to know as a diesel owner myself you eventually do learn where the diesel pumps are located. And the new modern direct injection diesels like these Volvos we have here have much better performance than the old ones used to have. At 1900 RPM you've got over 200 foot-pounds of torque. It's a very satisfying car to drive. The fuel economy of course is spectacular and though it sounded a little bit loud inside the car they're really quite quiet. So is there a market for a Volvo diesel? Well, when you think about the kind of customer who's attracted to Volvo, the practicality and the safety and security, I say to them, well, you got all the room and luxury and safety of a Volvo and 45 miles per gallon? What's wrong with this picture? Nothing that I can tell. I'm Jim Ken. Well, this week we gave you just a peek at the brand new 850 all-wheel drive. Now, next week on Test Drive, Graham will hit the roads of Sweden to see if Volvo is indeed on the right track in its effort to create a new image, an image of a manufacturer that builds not only safe cars, but also cars with a little pizzazz. That's next week as we continue to bring you more stories about cars and the people who drive them. Well, one of the things I look for when I'm uh, testing a vehicle is the uh, competency of the brakes. It's not, not the easiest thing to work on, is it? The object of the exercise really here, we've done a couple of comparison tests in the past. With minivans being so popular, it made common sense to have our next comparison test on the minivans. They're becoming increasingly more popular, and with Chrysler sort of setting the trend, the others are sort of scrambling to catch up. So this comparison test will find out if Chrysler still rule the roost, or are there other minivans that give them a serious run for their money. The Odyssey I found a little bit noisy, the engine, um you know, it's obviously having to work very hard for its living. There's one that's really showing its age and, and really showing its, uh, its sort of like antiquated design, and that's the Safari with its, uh, you know, body on frame um, uh, construction. Uh, but that's a vehicle that needs to be seriously rethought. TSN's Motoring 96 has been brought to you by Quaker State. Exceeds the highest standards for engine protection. And Midas, the way it should be.